So this will finish up the whole semester and finish up this section on nuclear transformations. We talked about all the different transformations that radionuclides undergo. And we looked at the uh, health and medical uses of radionuclides. And then today we're gonna be talking about nuclear energy, nuclear weapons, and then what to do with nuclear waste. And we'll compare it to fossil fuels in some respects. So I never understood it when I first learned about uh, like nuclear bombs and things like that, reading about them in popular science as a kid, how you could get energy out of fusion and energy out of fission. Because one breaks the atom apart, fission breaks the atom apart, fusion puts the atoms together. How do you get energy out of both of those situations? That's well, because the energy of the nucleus isn't, the, isn't linear. It's not, it's not a linear function. It looks like this. So this is the binding energy of the nucleus. And so, you know, iron, when you make an iron, it, this is really iron's not that special. You see how flat it is up here. So all these elements are, have pretty much the same binding energy for the nucleus per nucleon. Can I get you to close that one too for me? Yeah. And, and so as the atoms get closer and closer to, to iron, they get, they get lower and lower in energy. So this is the amount of energy that comes out when you make that nucleus. And so um, I've seen this also drawn kind of as a well. Right. Uh, so when we split, when we split a uranium nucleus, the two fragments are closer to iron. Okay, and so that means we get energy out. Okay, and then when we combine helium, so if we have helium down here, or hi yeah, hydrogen and make helium, we get an enormous amount. So per nucleon, that's the biggest. So going from hydrogen to to helium is the largest return of energy. So if we could figure out how to control fusion then we've solved our energy problems forever. Um, we pretty much have solved it practically forever in fission. We could run fission reactions and reprocess the fuel indefinitely. And you'll see that today, perhaps. But anyway, this is how it works. So we could fission heavy atoms, we could fuse light atoms, and both of those can give us energy. How much energy are we talking? Let's look at this. Um, it's a tremendous amount. And this is where it comes from. The masses of the fission products does not equal the masses of the reactants. And the same with the fusion. So when they find this, the masses of these isotopes and so on, they, they compare them to what they would get by just adding up the number of neutrons and, and protons. And those, uh, those masses don't equal. They called it the mass defect. So if I take, let's say I, I take a, a carbon atom which has six nitro six neutrons and six protons. I know the mass of a neutron and I know the mass of a proton. If I multiply those masses by six and add them together, they don't equal the mass of, of the carbon nucleus. The carbon nucleus is a little bit lighter than that. And some of that missing mass has been turned into energy. That's the binding energy. So they called it the mass defect because it was missing. They didn't know what to do with that. And then with Einstein's equation, we realize, oh, that mass was turned into energy. So we actually get to use Einstein's equation, E equals mc squared today. So let's look at the fusion reaction where we take two deuteriums, heavy hydrogens, and fuse them together to make a helium nucleus. And so that mass of the products minus the mass of the reactants would be that mass defect, the missing mass. So this is the isotopic mass of helium-4. And this is the isotopic mass of the deuteriums. And there's two of those. So with the products minus the reactants, this is the missing mass. So 0 0.02 grams per mole. Doesn't sound like a lot. But when we put that into this equation, it's going to be multiplied by the speed of light twice. Okay. So we put it in kilograms so that we get joules out. Kilograms, meter squared per second squared is a joule per mole. So we have this amount of kilograms. We move the decimal place over three to get to kilograms. And so we end up with 10 to the 12 joules per mole. That's absolutely enormous. We'll, we'll seek some comparisons in the notes. And so if we wanted to convert that to grams, so we'd, we'd take that and, and, um, and get out of the moles and get into grams of deuterium. This is 548 billion joules per gram of, of deuterium. <clears throat> That's absolutely enormous. 
So let's compare it to some things that, that we have, like our fossil fuels, right? How much energy is in coal or how much energy is in methane or, na- or uh, oil? And this is the World Energy Council. It's like a nonprofit group that sends surveys out to all the countries, the governments, and they do surveys of the of the fuel reserves, the fossil fuel reserves, the amount of wind power they generate, the amount of solar power they generate, the amount of biofuels they have, and they collect these reports and they put out the World Energy Report that tells the the world essentially where all the energy is and what countries can export and what they use and what they want to import and so on. And they look at the energy content in that fuel. And so these are the these are the energy contents for these. And this is for billion cubic meters of methane. There's 36 petajoules. So let's go through our uh, quickly go through our um, exponents. So exa is 10 to the 18. Peta is 10 to the 15. It's a peta tera giga. So tera is 10 to the 12th, and giga is 10 to the 9th. Okay. So this is 10 to the 9th joules, 45 times 10 to the 9th joules per ton of oil equivalent. So that right there is ton oil, essentially a ton of oil. And this is a ton of coal. <clears throat> so there's 29 gigajoules per ton of coal. So that's a ton of coal is 10 to the 6 grams. 29 gigajoules in 10 to the 6 grams of coal. And this is 548 gigajoules per gram. <laughs> <laughs> of hydrogen. That's unbelievable. Do you see what I mean by the unbelievable amount of energy in the nucleus per gram? You need a ton of coal and you get 29 billion joules. You get a gram of deuterium and get that to fuse, you get 548 gigajoules. That's unbelievable. So this is why we were excited about nuclear power at the beginning, you know, and still are. But I mean, this was they said, wow, we're going to be able to generate power and it's going to be too cheap to charge for. We're just going to be doling it out, you know. And so let's look at, um, and also there was a war going on when they were doing this research and they thought, oh my gosh, if our enemies get a hold of a bomb like this, then our cities are going to be decimated. So everybody started racing to make a bomb. They knew they had TNT bombs, so trinitrotoluene, that's what TNT stands for. It, a ton of TNT releases about 4 billion joules, so 4 gigajoules per ton of TNT. And uranium-235, um, this is the question, how much is you needed to equal a ton of TNT if, uh, if it gives off 2 times 10 to the 13 joules per mole? So I wanted to just get that into grams so we could make a ton of it. So this is 2 times 10 to the 13 joules per mole. And I just used the 235 mass number to give us the rough mass of that isotope. And, and so this gives us 85 uh, billion joules per gram. So 85 gigajoules per gram. Not as much as the hydrogen. Hydrogen was 500 and something, okay? This is 85 gigajoules per gram. Or if you wanna make a ton of uranium, then it's 10 to the six grams. So you gotta put 10 to the six on top. So this is how many billion joules you get from a ton of uranium. And so just one gram, tiny little, like a dollar bills mass of uranium is equal to 21 tons of TNT in terms of explosive power. And that's amazing. And so it really is, in terms of our energy consumption, it is really an endless, endless source of energy. So this is in 1945 when they were working on the Manhattan Project, trying to come up with a, a nuclear device. They built one and they wanted to test it, but it was the only one they ever made. And they were, it was scarce, they were, you know, the scarcity of material. 
they didn't want to blow it up and then have all the sensors not work, <laughs> right? You want to measure how much blast it gives and how much light it gives and so on. So they set up their sensors, their pressure sensors, their light sensors, and all the, like seismic sensors and everything. And they blew up a hundred tons of TNT just to give a, you know, a test to test their sensors. So they built this scaffolding here and these are, crates of uh, like C4 plastic explosives, but it's TNT plastic explosives in these crates. And there's 13 guys standing in front of it. It's an old black and white film that I got from this technical report uh, from the Los Alamos National Laboratory. It's freeware. You can, I mean, you can find it online. There's 13 people who built that tower and put all the explosives in place. And so they pose for a picture. So that's, that's 13 people across. You can't put that on an airplane. It's too big. It's too, you know, and it weighs a hundred tons. You're not going to get that off the ground. But they'd use that to test their their uh, sensors. But they put something that was, uh, you know, two hundred times more powerful on a plane. This is the size of the Trinity shot, and here's uh, Ray Bradbury standing next to it, and that's the equivalent of twenty thousand tons of TNT explosive power. So when they say it's like a an 800 pound bomb or a thousand pound or 20,000 pound bomb. They're talking about equivalence to TNT in explosive power. So that bomb doesn't weigh 800 pounds. It has the explosive power of 800 pounds of TNT. Or, or like there's a, the Moab, the mother of all bombs, they call it. It's a 20,000 pound uh, fuel air bomb. And it doesn't weigh 20,000 pounds. It has 20,000 pounds of explosive power. And this is a 20 kiloton t uh, device. It has 20,000 tons of TNT explosive equivalent. And so that was the Trinity shot. So they blew that up and then they made a couple of bombs and, and helped in the war. Um, and so this is, that was 1945. How can we make this bomb small enough to put on a plane? And now we have a new problem, the millennial problem. This was uh, the Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City. So, so quite a while ago. Timothy McVeigh, I don't know if you've heard of that. He was upset about an FBI raid in Idaho. And he um, loaded up a rider van with, uh, with drums of ammonium nitrate fuel oil. So he had six drums or so in this rider van. Is that the hospital thing? It was a it was a federal courthouse, oh. yeah. And this was you know how they have these porticos you drive drive under and you can you know make deliveries and get out and get in and stay out of the rain and so on. He drove this rider truck underneath there and then walked off, and they had a timer in there, and he had ammonium nitrate. And diesel. So that's a. ANFO is what it's called, A-N-F-O, ammonium nitrate fuel oil. And it is it is a powerful explosive. You mix it in and make a slurry, and the ammonium nitrate, the nitrate has oxygen in it. So the thing that makes an explosive is that you have the oxygen right there with the fuel. So you don't need the oxygen from the atmosphere. It's all right there. Shockwave comes through, and then all the atoms are free to make their lowest energy conformation. So we make nitrogen gas, we make water, we make CO2, and then those things are hot gases and they expand and that's where the explosion comes from. So then you, he put on top of it a, a detonator, some explosive charge with a, you know, with a timer, little alarm clock. And so, and then he walks away and then boom, blows up the front of this building. So that was a rider truck full of explosives and it didn't even take down a building. It destroyed the building, killed a lot of people. But in terms of chemical bombs, this is a chemical bomb. Okay, and, and here's a chair. So a chair looks about that size in this picture. So this next picture is the same scale. So that chair, if I were to put that chair right here by the rail, that would be a picture of the nuclear device that was detonated in Nevada that's the back side of the crater. Now this was a, you know, a hundred feet down or so. They were trying to actually make as big a crater as possible. This was part of the Plowshares program. It's called Sedan Crater, where they bur buried the nuclear device at the 
precise depth that would make the deepest crater. Like the engineers got in there and figured all that out because they were going to say, what if we need to quickly or cheaply build, a, if we want to build a canal, like if we want to cut another canal, say through Panama or someplace like that, could we use nuclear weapons for peaceful purposes and not, not war? And so this was part of the plowshare program where they were trying to see how deep could we dig and how fast could we dig using nuclear bombs. It worked in the sense that it made a big hole. It didn't work in a sense that because it was buried, all of that radioactive debris was in the sand and landed, and this place was incredibly radioactive. So it was really unusable. Yes, they could dig a hole, but it was incredibly radioactive. So it was probably not a great great idea to implement. And that's why we don't dig canals with nuclear weapons, okay? Because it just contaminates the heck out of everything. Anyway, um, but just for scale, that's about 25 city blocks. Hmm. They know I'm talking about weapons. <laughs> <laughs> Is it Amber Alert? Yeah. Is there anything we can do? Okay, it's not campus activities. Okay, so this is one that was underwater, and this is called the um, Crossroads Baker Shot. Baker. And they put it on, on a barge under the water and detonated it, and it shot all of this. I mean, it was, it's, you can Google it or YouTube, go on there and look for Crossroads Baker. Um, it's so powerful. There, Early on in the blast, you see this black shape in the side of the mushroom cloud of the water that's going up and it's a battleship. Like it just got launched. That's how powerful that is. Now, okay, that's great. Makes a big blast, it's a huge bomb. You could take that same amount, something that's small that could fit in a, in a truck and power 21,000 homes for a year. Just a few pounds of uranium could power that many homes for a year. Um, this is a picture of a actual nuclear bomb. It's actually a trainer. There's nothing nuclear in the inside. Uh, I worked at Pantex from 20, 2001 to 2004, and this is a colleague. Or he was a student of mine in the master's program and then um, worked out there at, at Pantex. I can show the picture. It's unclassified. I just can't tell you what the device is. So, um, so then uh, nuclear fission, how does this work? You know, how does it, how does we get, how do we get this chain reaction going? And a lot of times they, they draw the nucleus with discrete little neutrons and protons, right? Like a cluster of grapes. I don't really think that's a great picture. I think it's more like this. You see how that's kind of more like a water drop? <coughs> so it's, a, it's a, just a little oscillating water drop. And if it gets real thin in the middle, it can split. And when it splits, you can have little pearls in between that are neutrons. Like when it splits and these drops come apart, you have these little drops in the middle. We were at a, a thrift store, you know, antique store walking around, and they had a lava lamp. And I was watching the lava lamp and it, you know how they, you ever seen a lava lamp? They squeeze out and it squeezed out and broke. And there were these little bitty drops in the middle. And I was like, neutrons. And my wife was like, don't embarrass me. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so then I bought the lava lamp. So it's, it's in my room upstairs. Yeah. And so it's, so it kind of squeezes out when it gets unstable. The wave function starts to oscillate in an unstable manner. And then it, it squeezes apart and makes new nuclei and we get, we get uh, neutrons. And so that's what makes uranium-235 and plutonium and some a few other elements really useful is because they have a net gain in neutrons. So you see one came in, one came out here, but then we got a net gain of two. So then those can hit other nuclei and stimulate fission. So this is a fun little video that the students did at this school, it's a little science academy. And let me stop it. Uh, let's flip OBS so we can see the, the video. Yeah, here we go. So they have the little picture out of the book. So they were nice and patient and actually did a stop stop motion picture. So 
So this is a perfect situation. It's never perfect, but notice how all three hit other nuclei. Some of them would escape, okay? But it gets the point across. Yeah. I wish my school was this fun. This is a high school, you know. <laughs> we didn't have anything like this. And they did this right. A lot of the demos you see, like there's one on Jimmy Kimmel, where um, they just have one ping pong on each mouse trap, but they have two, so it doubles. She's eating the Skittles, I think. Okay, see the barriers? Why are they putting the barriers in there? So they can keep it all in. Yeah, keep what in? The what do the what do the balls represent? The neutrons. neutrons. The ping pong balls are the neutrons. It's the neutron flux that you control when you're controlling a nuclear reaction. It's the neutron flux. And those walls return the neutrons. So they act, kind of act like um, moderators in terms of controlling the neutrons. If, if you don't have those walls there, you have too much neutron loss. And, if, and it could be that it wouldn't, even, it wouldn't even work. Like if you hit a mousetrap and the ball shoots off the table and never hits another mousetrap, that's a subcritical mass. Okay, because the probability of escape is greater than the probability of impact. And so then you can take a subcritical mass and add this cladding to keep the neutrons in. And now a subcritical mass can become a critical or supercritical mass. So neutron control is, is the way you control a nuclear reaction. So that was a pretty nice slow burn. So this would be like a nuclear power situation where you're you're trying to drag it out as long as possible. So they did kind of in a slow-mo here. <laughs> Some of them are either hit, even hitting the ceiling and coming back down. So the ceiling is acting like cladding as well. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah. Yeah, right. Okay, so that was fun. Um, yeah, and so then here's one. This one, I would call this one a, a nuclear bomb. Okay, so what they had was more like a, a nuclear reactor because the, they would let a lot of the neutrons escape. And so if you let the neutrons escape or if you have something that absorbs them, then you can keep the burn at a, at a manageable temperature. And that's what the control rods are for. So you put control rods between the fuel elements so the neutrons get absorbed by the control rod and you can keep it cool. If you want it to completely quench, you drop all the control rods in and then you're in a situation where more neutrons are absorbed than, than are hit with other nuclei. But if you want a bomb, then you take the control rods out, you put cladding on there so you can train all the neutrons. Look how fast when this goes. I realize it's not 360 mousetraps, but you can really see how fast it runs through the whole container. Let me start it again. You see how fast it burned? <laughs> Went right through. And that's what a nuclear bomb is like. The material is burned up in a couple of, you know, like 30 to 40 nanoseconds. And and all of, pretty much all of the doublings you're gonna get are done. And then the rest is just escape of heat and, and material. Okay. <clears throat> so this is what we mean by subcritical mass. You have <clears throat> escaping neutrons. And a supercritical mass, you've got a big enough mass that the chances are this neutron, see here, this neutron escaped. But if there's another nucleus there, like right here, it could hit it. 
And so if you get a big enough mass, then you have a supercritical mass and you can have uh, a nuclear burn. And if it's, if it's dense like this, then you have a bomb. If you have this much material and no control rods and nothing in the middle to control neutrons, that's a bomb. Um, if you have these masses separated from each other by control rods and then another mass here, then you're, if you move, remove the control rod, that neutron can go over here and hit a nucleus. But if you put the control rod in, it blocks it. And so you can control these by making tiny little fuel pellets and putting them in a moderator and then using the control rods to moderate the burn. Okay. And this is the first moderated nuclear pile. They had uranium pellets, uranium oxide pellets in a graphite pile. And so this is called a nuclear pile. They had the control rods in here. They had some, some lines. You don't really see the control rod lines. <clears throat> they had these uh, Geiger counters in here. Oh, control rods are down here. So he was pushing the control rods in and out. And as they pull the control rods out, they got a sustained uh, um, nuclear reaction, chain reaction. And they were looking at the counter and Fermi was so good at the math, he was using his slide rule and predicting what the signal would be when they pulled it out another inch or two. And he would like make his prediction and they'd pull it out an inch or two and the data would go right up to his mark. And he, he understood the geometry and the neutron flux and that just told him that they absolutely knew how to control a nuclear reaction at that point. <clears throat> and so they, they actually built a, a nuclear generator or nuclear power pile before they built the bomb. So they knew that they could do this. Um, there were some problems with the graphite design that they knew early on. And so we never built graphite power reactors in this country, um, but the Russians did. And so the Russians had a few spies in this group and they took the material, uh, the information back to their country and, and started making bombs. And then they also made um, uh, nuclear reactors for power use too. But the Chernobyl design used graphite, just like that original pile. And so in here was a graphite core, or yeah. And so the control rods went down in the graphite, the steam pipes went through the graphite, and the uranium was, uh, fuel elements were placed in around the graphite. And the, the problem with, uh, with this particular reactor was it's called a boiling water reactor. <clears throat> if this, see up here is, is gas right here and liquid right there. So we have liquid on the bottom, gas on top. And if the flow, if this pump goes down, if there's a problem with the flow of that water, this meniscus will come down in here and, and start, you know, emptying out. So you might have steam there and the neutron flux increases when there's steam versus when there's water. And so the water was acting as a mod as a neutron control. And if you boil it down below the level of the fuel, then you're getting sort of a counteraction of the control rods. And so this can run away from you. And that's what happened at Chernobyl. They did a, they did a test for different um, failures and like pump failures and so on. And, <clears throat> And they, the test and the safety systems and so on did not work. And it started to boil away. And when it boiled away, it got super hot. And then when it got super hot, it, it thermalized the water. Then you've got the hydrogen and oxygen combined. Then you have an explosion and it blew the top off of this containment vessel. So then we had exposed fuel. So this blew off. If you ever get a chance to see that HBO special on Chernobyl, it's amazing, okay? And, and this is, this, the guys were walking around on the top of this thing, okay? And then when it blew off, all of that chunks of graphite that were super radioactive were spewed into the air. Then oxygen rushed in and guess what? Graphite's flammable. And so it caught fire. And so then all these radionuclides are being blown out of the top of this reactor. I got a book on the Chernobyl disaster and in there it was talking about a fellow just a, you know, a couple miles away or a few miles away sunbathing on his roof. He didn't realize, but the cloud that was coming down from Chernobyl 
he was getting irradiated. And like in just 30 minutes, he had terrible burns on his skin. He's like, what's going on? And of course, the whole time the Soviet Union was saying, there's no, there's no problem. There's no problem. And, and people in Sweden and all these places were registering radioactivity like crazy. Like how would, how would they know, right? Well, they have got monitors for atmospheric testing and so on for nuclear weapons. And so these radiation monitors were going berserk. And like I would know something was up too if I'm doing my day with the Geiger counter and I'm looking at the background and I tell you it should be 13 counts per minute and I'm looking it's 27 or 100 or something like that. I'm like, whoa, what's going on, you know? And and so just, again, you can detect that radioactivity. So that was Chernobyl, total disaster. Um, poor design. Again, we never had those designs. We used a pressurized liquid reactors. And so notice inside this, this primary steam loop, there's no meniscus. Okay. The control rods are gravity fed. Also the control rods in the graphite, even if they, uh, if they got bent just a little bit, they couldn't go into the holes and that explosion bent the control rods so they couldn't even put them in. This is water. So we have fuel elements and fuel elements and water in between. And so the control rods can go through the water um, and they're gravity fed. So if something, if we lose power or whatever, they drop in. Here's the primary loop under pressure. This is the only water in this primary loop that's touching the radioactive material. And so this primary loop is radioactive. That water is radioactive and it's in con inside this containment shell. So when you see the nuclear reactors and you see those containment shells, that's where the radioactivity is. Then going through the walls of that containment, we have the secondary loop of water. So the heat in this pressurized water flashes the secondary water to steam. And then that steam turns the turbine. And then the turbine turns the generator and the generator takes electricity to your house. So you see, we are pretty far away from the radioactive stuff. So when people joke about like, uh, you know, the, the rivers, Comanche Peak is a power plant and there's a, there's a river, I mean, there's a river or a lake right there. The, the lake or the river is not in contact with the nuclear fuel. <laughs> That'd be a bad thing. <laughs> the nuclear fuel is inside the containment facility. We have a secondary loop. So the, the lake water or river water is not even con in contact with the first loop. It's in contact with the second loop. And it's after it goes through the steam turbine. There's still some heat in that water. They want to reuse it. And so they run it through a condenser and then condense it back to water. And they take some of that waste heat and put it in the river. So, so that's, that's how it's going. That's how it's done. Um, these are like, you know, four inches of steel and concrete and so on. Definitely made to withstand um, a lot of pressure and to contain uh, any of the radioactive material. In Three Mile Island, there was an accident in New Jersey in the 70s, and they, the reactor got too hot. It cracked this, this uh, primary coolant loop. The fuel did not leave the, the reactor zone, but the water leaked out, and some radioactive water leaked out inside this containment zone. And that was all the radiation that was released. No one was injured, no one was sick, and they went in and they had to clean up the water and they closed down the, the, uh, that particular power plant because of that accident. But, you know, you hear, oh, Three Mile Island, again, no radiation escaped the containment vessel. Certainly none of it made it into the river or anything like that. And that's like the United States' most um, well-known nuclear accident is Three Mile Island. Um, so I've talked pretty much about all of this, that, that the control rods control the neutrons between the fuel rods, and that helps us maintain a consistent burn and power output. Um, here's our success story, the U.S. Nuclear Navy. Since 1964, we've run our carriers and most of our battleships with nuclear power plants. So we have nuclear reactors on these and our nuclear submarines. So in terms of fuel, now our nuclear submarines never even have to be refueled. The power plant that they put in there has enough fuel in it that they can run it for the life of the submarine. So when they go below surface, they don't need any fuel. They don't need to let the engine breathe. The old diesel submarines, if you watch World War II movies, they had to go up and, re 
and recharge their batteries. So they had to run the diesel engine to charge the batteries and the diesel engine had to breathe. So it had to bring in oxygen and give off smoke. And they were really vulnerable because they're giving off a bunch of diesel smoke, easily detected from the air. Um, but with nuclear submarines, they don't have to do that. So these guys will go underwater and be underwater for months at a time. Kind of strange. They even can generate their own water with the electricity that the power plant produces. They can make pure water and hydrolyze that uh, uh, and clean it up, desalinate the water. Uh, most of the issue for the nuclear force is, is food. And so uh, when they disembark, they were walking on their food. They have like canned goods and stuff that's stacked up a couple of layers on all of the floors of the whole sub. <laughs> and so as they, as they move through and they like move the food around and so on, and they'll drop it a level and then drop it a level. So they walk around on their food for a couple of months. So I thought that was interesting. So here's some of the facts. Uh, there have been different, 27 different power plants put into these ships, 210 nuclear powered ships, and that number's growing. Over 500 reactor cores in operation and 5,400 reactor years of operation. So if you take the number of reactors times the number of years they've been operating, we have 5,000 years of experience using nuclear power safely. And they've steamed over 128 million miles. Anyway, I thought that was cool. And those are the sailors standing in the E equals MC squared. <laughs> so that's kind of a nice, good photo op. Um, Okay, so let's talk then about <clears throat> how this power, this energy, is related to the environment. Because I like this diagram. This is from Stanley Manahan's Environmental Chemistry book. We talked about the resources uh, a little bit. We have, um, you know, nuclear resources, and then they, we can use those to make energy. We also have fossil resources and wind and, and solar, and those are all connected to the environment. And so there is absolutely no such thing as zero impact or zero emissions. I'm sure you're noticing that when you talk about electric cars, they say, yeah, there's no fossil fuels, but you got to mine the elements for the batteries. And then you got to do something with the battery waste. And so let's look at the total energy landscape. And so looking at those world energy values, we have 25,000 exajoules in coal. So I took that you know, that uh, tons of coal and multiplied it by that conversion factor from the World Energy Council. And we got 25,000 exajoules of coal identified in the world, 26,000 exajoules of oil, and 6,000 exajoules of natural gas. And that number has gone up. So that's, that's a low estimate. We also have 9,000 exajoules of uranium ready to go in terms of nuclear fuel. And then 2,000 exajoules of, of uh, renewables like biomass, um, uh, and uh, wind energy, but mostly that's biomass, the renewables. And so that's a lot of energy, but how does it compare to the world consumption? World consumption is 425 uh, exajoules per year. The U.S. is a fourth of that, 115 exajoules per year. 2002, I think this past year, we were like up to um, 120 exajoules per year. 2035 prediction is to 140 exajoules per year. And so look at those numbers. We have thousands of exajoules in all of these resources and the world uses 425, okay? So we're not in a situation where we're, we're about to run out of energy, okay? Um, and when you add in solar, look how many exajoules the sun gives us on the planet. That's unbelievable. Five million, five million exajoules per year hits the planet. Now, we can't harvest all of that or we'd cover the whole planet in solar cells. <laughs> Sounds dystopian, right? But um, you could easily take, and I've done this, I don't want to tell you which state it is, but you could take the, the square miles of the states in the United States and, and like one whole state, if you could turn that into solar panels. That's a big area, right? But if we could sacrifice one state, we could power the world <laughs> in solar. Yeah, and so that's unbelievable. That's the, that's the footprint of 425 exajoules with solar cells. So which, we don't have an energy problem. That's totally different than what you hear in terms of just common vernacular, you know. So this is the global path right now. Most of our energy mix is fossil fuels, right? These right here, and so 
as we start moving into biomass. Notice biomass increases, but it kind of tops out because um, if you look at those efficiencies that I showed you on that chart before, photosynthesis was only half a percent efficient. And so that means it doesn't harvest, uh, it doesn't make fuel very well. And so half a percent to make fuel that you're going to then burn and then use for fuel or go into solar and voltaics, which is 20 percent um, efficient. So this is the key right here is solar. But you still need things that are portable for transportation, like gas and oil. OK, it's the mix that's important. And so this whole idea that we're going to just get rid of fossil fuels, it doesn't make any sense because of the energy density. The amount of energy per liter, if you want to say, is so much higher in oil than it is in batteries. And, and batteries weigh a lot. OK, in a in a in a liter of oil, most of that liter is oil, the energy content, the fuel in a battery the same size. Most of that is not. It's electrodes. It's the substrates. It's the container. Only it's a very small amount of chemical that's pushing electrons in a battery. But in fuel, for transportation, oil is the way to go. Oil, you know, when I say oil, I just mean all of the hydrocarbons, right? Diesel, gas, whatever, even propane. Okay. So there's no global supply problem, but resources cost money, and they're they're sold, not shared. And so economics and politics enter the fray, right? Negotiations between countries and so on. Those are not scientific questions, but everybody wants to grab the scientist and say the scientist is on their side, okay? And so that's why I'm really sad. I mean, global warming has become 90% political and they're making it an economic issue when really we need scientists to just say, no, what makes sense for this? If I wanna fly a plane in the air, I need low weight, high energy content. I need jet fuel. It's, it's not a conspiracy. But if we could convert other things over to solar or what have you, that's great. Some facility, maybe we have uh, more efficiency. If we can get to 30% or 35% efficiency on solar cells, then the square f uh, footage of the roof would power the whole house. Right now, you need a little bit more. And if you got two stories, you're in trouble. Okay. But as we get the efficiencies of those solar cells up, that's where we're really gonna see growth for, for home power. And then we don't need to use the coal for the power plants. Okay, so there's lots of paths forward. And I would just encourage you as future scientists to be thinking smartly about it. I Honestly, you can ignore all the trash you hear on the internet and the news because they don't know what they're talking about. Okay, and don't just listen to me, do your own research. That's why you're in this class to learn about science. And so as you get a more questioning eye, and more competent, you can you can do the math. You can look to see if it makes sense. What's the energy per gram in a battery? What's the energy per gram in gasoline? What's the energy per gram in methane? Okay, and then there's certain situations where that makes the most sense. Okay, what about pollution? This is the best uh, definition of pollution I've ever seen. And so this one, I definitely want you to put a star by. It's from environmental chemistry book that I used to teach out of when I taught that course. And it's a loss of control of a concentrated substance that causes harm. So it's three parts. Harm is subjective. I mean, it can be quantified, right? If you're talking about cancer risk or what have you, but still it's, it's kind of uh, situational. Concentration is also subjective. Which concentration? You want to keep it as low as reasonably achievable or just to the first clinical effects or LD50, which would be a bad choice, right? Um, but anyway, concentration is subjective, but control is not. And so that's what we focus on in pollution control. We're controlling the pollutants. And so gases are really difficult to control. If you have a smokestack or a tailpipe, it's out of your control, okay? And liquids are prone to leak, but they're easier to control than gases and more dense, but solids are the best. And so if you can produce a solid waste, that's the best. Okay. So what we do for our coal fired power plants, instead of letting all the ash blow out of the top and land on the communities around the, the power plant, we spray water in that stack. And so those, those are called scrubbing and all of that water cools the gases and 
collects all the ash and it all falls down. Inside that pipe is just rainfall and it's pulling down the calcium oxides and the uranium oxides and the mercury oxides and all of these things. And they fall down to this slurry pit and they pump it outside and then they dry it somehow. And when they dry that, it's called fly ash and it's a solid. So all of that contaminant that would have gone out of the stack is collected in fly ash. And it's a pretty good substance. So they blend it in with, with other natural sources and make concrete with it. And so it's sequestered now. So the, the contaminants from the coal, the, you know, it, it was dug out of the ground. So it's got all kinds of rocks and stuff in it. Those contaminants uh, are sucked out with the scrubbing and then put into concrete. And so we blend that in with our concrete. Some of those contaminants are radioactive and there's few of them do get by. So a coal fired power plant actually produces more radioactive output than a nuclear one, <laughs> like in the gaseous form. So it's kind of, that's a trivia question for you. Uh, so if we could avoid gaseous pollutants, that'd be great. So if we take our fuel, reprocess it, blend it in with silicon, basically sand, silicon oxide, and melt it, and then pour it into these little ingots. This is vitrified nuclear waste. It's pretty radioactive, okay? But the fact that it's radioactive is great. I can track where it is. And the fact that it's a glass is great because it's not gonna leach out into the environment. So this is uh, the waste disposal facility that we built out at Yucca Mountain. And, and there was also a natural nuclear reactor in West Africa that shows that radioactive species, one, can be, can be generated naturally. So there was a, a, a sustained chemical reaction or chain reaction in this mountain for, for many years. And then uh, we also have this waste repository, Yucca Mountain in Nevada and waste isolation plant near Carlsbad. And so we can store this vitrified waste in these rock formations. But the problem is they won't open Yucca Mountain because of the environmental impact statement. And they want that impact statement to guarantee that no radiation will come out at more than 100 rem per year up to a million years. And that's beyond our engineering capabilities. How can you guarantee that you're gonna build a facility that will be stable for from 10,000 to a million years? We don't know how to do that. And so they won't let us open it, okay? So anyway, that's, that's the status of our waste disposal. Uh, they're worried about this vitrified waste in the bedrock of Nevada. But if you go to Google Maps and turn on satellite view and look in Nevada test site, you'll see all these little divots. It kind of looks like the surface of a golf ball. You know what those divots are? Craters? Craters from nuclear bombs. <laughs> yeah, 828 underground detonations, doing tests and so on. And they're, in, they're just in the rock. They're not encapsulated or anything like that. And so if there's any contamination happening in Nevada, it's from this. <laughs> it's not from Yucca Mountain. And it will continue to be from this, not from Yucca Mountain. So you can tell I'm a big proponent of opening Yucca Mountain and actually having uh, the, a place where we can put our fuel. Because you know where they're storing it now? No, at the, at the nuclear reactor sites, in the pool and they're just holding it in these pools. Remember what happened to Fukushima? That was where the explosion happened, was in the waste storage pool, not in the nuclear reactor. So we are in a dangerous situation without Yucca Mountain being open. And so it's a balance of risk. We're balancing the radiation dose 10,000 years in the future versus the risk of having re nuclear waste in a pool right there at the plant. Doesn't make a lot of sense. Okay, that's all I can, my rant is over. <laughs> Have a great day and a great Thanksgiving.